Hello and welcome to another edition of On The Line Perspectives on Partition, a series organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust to explore people's thoughts on one of the most significant events in modern Irish history, the partition of the island 100 years ago this year. My name is Paul McFadden and our guest today is a County Derry woman whose strength of feeling in relation to national identity drove her to the courts to have not only her Irishness but her non-Britishness asserted. Emma de Souza, political commentator and campaigner, welcome to this series. Um, I want to go back, Emma, if I may, to 2015 and that issue which thrust you into the news headlines, really. It's when you and your new husband found yourselves at the centre of a, you know, a, a legal and a, a political and a constitutional storm almost over the issue of identity. C can you briefly refresh our memories about that, that uh, big moment in your life? Of course, and thank you so much for having me uh, on today. It's a pleasure to speak with you. In terms of um, how did we end up in that position? Well, it was all quite accidental. I like to joke that I find myself in that situation because I fell in love with an American and then he fell in love with here and we decided to make our home uh, in Northern Ireland. And we went through the process then of stabilizing his immigration status so that he could remain as the spouse of an Irish and an EU national. Now in 2015, I wasn't politically active um, like many young people, I had become very disenfranchised from the divisive politics of Northern Ireland and had little interest in it. And in terms of my understanding of the Good Friday Agreement, well, it was pretty scarce as well. All I really understood was that we had the right to be accepted as Irish or British or both. And I always saw this as a great privilege, that we had that plurality of identity and it could be respected. And so I was surprised in 2015 when I applied for my husband's visa to be told by the British Home Office that I was in fact considered a British citizen. And that until such times as I accepted I was British, declared myself as British, paid them to get rid of being British, I could not access my rights as an Irish and an EU national in Northern Ireland. So at the time I turned to my solicitor and I said, well, this can't be right because the Good Friday Agreement gives us the right to be accepted as Irish or British or both. And I'm an Irish citizen. I've only ever held an Irish passport. I've been raised Irish. I've been Irish my whole life. Why should I have to give up or undermine my identity in order to access my rights, which I'm already supposed to have under an international treaty? And that was really the starting point. We thought back then that this was just a clerical error and that somebody at the Home Office didn't understand that Northern Ireland does have a different set of rights and entitlements. But we discovered when we went to the press and spoke to other families that this was a systemic undermining of a fundamental provision of the Good Friday Agreement and that this provision had never actually been implemented into domestic UK citizenship legislation. And that's, I suppose, where a very public political campaign came from as well. We then spent half a decade in the courts, which was the first five years of our marriage, challenging the British Home Office on this to the point where we did secure substantive legislative changes to domestic UK immigration law. You, you weren't the first people to find yourselves in that position, though, of, of you know, experiencing difficulty with trying to uh, access that uh, EEA ar arrangement. But you were the first, certainly, to feel sufficiently strong to go to, well, uh, a tribunal, then another tribunal, you took on the, the, the Home Office. Why were you so exercised about this issue? What was it about it that annoyed you or offended you? Well, for me, it just felt inherently wrong. There was something so unjust about the process that I was being expected to go through. First off, when we went to the first tier tribunal, I had to outline for the courts every moment in my life that showed that I was an Irish citizen. It's included things like my grandmother reading Irish fairy tales to me as a child, that I did Irish dancing, that I did Irish language for GCSE. And the fact that these things were considered evidence of my Irishness seemed incredibly wrong to me as well. Why should I have to prove that I'm Irish? And the fact that I used to joke, well, if I had done French for GCSE, would I not be able to establish the weight of my Irishness? So this process felt to me very unjust. It felt wrong that an Irish citizen would have to go through this in order to prove to the courts that they are in fact Irish. And considering the text of the Good Friday Agreement, 
it seemed that the Home Office and the British government were undermining and failing to uphold their rights, uh, their requirements under the agreement to uphold that right. And so I felt like I had to challenge that through the courts. But in 2016 or 2017, I believe actually, we won at the first tier tribunal. And so from that point on, we were defending a decision in our favor. And that's why we kept going through the courts. We understood that there were a number of other families that were equally affected, not just Irish citizens, but also those who identified as British, equally affected by this policy. And we knew that we were lucky in that we were getting uh, political support and media support around our case. And it felt to us that there was a responsibility to push this through so that we could help all those coming behind us and ensure that no other family was going to be negatively impacted by this policy. What What did your husband, Jake, make of all of this, the toing and froing, the battles in the tribunals? You, you won the first one. The whole Home Office, I think, was succeeded in uh, winning a ruling in their favour uh, the second time. And then you secured, I think, what was kind of portrayed in the papers as, as a victory without being explicitly kind of stated as a victory. Yeah, we um, we see that as them uh, conceding. They conceded it to our legal argument and changed domestic UK immigration law so that my husband and any other uh, spouse of a Northern Ireland person would be able to remain under EU regulations. So they did that just two weeks before the case was due to go back to the Court of Appeal. And in many ways, that made sense because the, the decision in the Home Office favour, which was in 2019, could very well have been overturned in the Court of Appeal. So it makes sense that they would do a political concession of sorts before having to return to the courts. In terms of my husband's um, take in all this, well, he had a real crash course. I don't think he knew what he was <laughs> signing up for whenever he married me and decided that he really wanted to live in the north of Ireland. Um, but he comes from a very liberal, progressive West Coast family who are all equally, um, were all equally affronted by the situation that we find ourselves in. And he has become just as passionate, if in some ways not more so than I have in ensuring that this right can be upheld for everyone in Northern Ireland. So I've been very proud of um, how he has taken on the challenges that we were faced and taken on the role that not too many people have been forced into. And I'm lucky that I had him as a support um, a support system for me in going through that process. You've had your supporters, you know, uh, kind of on, on both sides of the political argument in the North um, and on both sides of the border. You've had people like Leo Varadkar, for example, uh, rallying to uh, to the cause on your behalf and the, on the same side of the argument as you. What do people in the Republic make of uh, the lengths you went to and the lengths you felt you had to go to to assert your Irishness and, and all the rights that, that ensued from that under the Good Friday Agreement? Well, I think that there's a couple of perspectives. Um, in the first instance, it can seem at times that those in the South are perhaps not fully aware of how difficult it can be to be Irish in the North. And that we are still in a position where often our Irishness is undermined or we have to defend it in some shape or form. And those who were born on the other side of the border, you know, they get to experience growing up as an Irish citizen without the same kind of challenges. So I think our case raised a lot of concern and highlighted that this kind of injustice was still happening um, in the North. And the support that we received from a political level um, in the South was quite substantial um, and that all the party leaders supported our case. They all agreed with the position that we took. And uh, to this day, we received quite substantial political support from the Republic of Ireland and their representatives in ensuring that the wider concerns that were raised on the underlying legislation continues to be addressed in a substantive way. Everything that we've talked uh, about up until now, um, it traces, uh, can be traced back to the issue which is at the core of this series of programmes organised by the Bloody Sunday Trust, uh, the issue of partition, the border, in other words, this line which divides this island into two uh, distinct political jurisdictions. You're a young woman, uh, much, much younger than I am. Um, what is your take on 
what happened almost 100 years ago or what was done almost 100 years ago. As you look back, I mean, clearly you're a thinking young woman, uh, you're an intelligent young woman, and I've no doubt you have a strong opinion on what happened or what was done 100 years ago. So what, what would you say about it? Well, you're very kind there um, in your description. In terms of my views of partition, it's a pretty complex question. Um, if you look at the historical significance and you consider how partition came about, it would seem to me that the partition of the island was a temporary measure that was put in place because there was a question that couldn't be answered um, and the challenge of ensuring that those who have a British identity or from a unionist background were going to be respected and I think that that challenge now falls to a whole new generation in ensuring that those from that background can be respected in any constitutional changes. In terms of the border there's lots of cases around the um, you know, the economic impact of the border, but also the human rights impacts and the trauma that has been um, inflicted on the people of this island over the past 100 years. But I like to look also at the partition of mines on the island of Ireland. And I believe it was John Hume who once said that the true division in Ireland is not the land, but in the hearts and minds of its people. And I think that that's very true even today that there is a disconnect between the people north and south of this island, despite the fact that we, of course, hold the same hopes, aspirations, fears, concerns as uh, any person across this island, we still see that there is an inability to truly understand each other on both sides of the island. And we see that now. The Explain to me, Emma, how that manifests itself, exactly that disconnect that you talk about. Well, I think that it manifests itself a lot um, in politics at the moment. You know, we see that conversations are beginning to shift quite sharply to the possibility of constitutional change. And with that comes a narrative that continues to, to portray or depict Northern Ireland in a particular way, depicted as maybe akin to still be in 1985 or 1972 with the the narrative that any sort of talk around constitutional change would surely end up in a resort, resort to violence, but also the depiction and the narrative that the people of Northern Ireland are solely unionist and nationalist. And I believe that these binary political labels do a disservice to the people of Northern Ireland because they are in essence used against us. They are a continuation of segregation and a continuation of placing people in an us versus them narrative and I think that it does not adequately uh, you know display or depict the plurality and diversity of the people of Northern Ireland today rather it shows a lack of progress when in reality over the past two decades there has been substantial progress in reconciliation across this island but in particular in Northern Ireland with people opting to hold both passports or people opting to become part of the Irish nation in an increasing number. And we see a lot of reconciliation in places such as East Belfast with the East Belfast GAA Club, with the East Belfast schools that are voting to become integrated. So there is progress all around us in Northern Ireland. And I think that the, this disconnect and this narrative of the North as a place still at odds with itself is not reflective of Northern Ireland today and is more used as a means to deter people from having meaningful conversations over the future of this island. But although I think, you know, come back a few years ago, we saw with the issue of the, the Union flag on uh, City Hall in Belfast, and more recently, the, the whole question of the Northern Ireland Protocol. We, we, we've seen examples of things which can drive people into their different trenches in the North. Um, and, and one, arguably very, potentially very divisive issue would relate to the issue of a, a border poll. Um, I, I wonder where you stand on that question, you know, whether there should or should not be a border poll, um, and if so, how soon ought it to be held? Um, well, I fall into the category of people that believe that um, it is only a matter of time before there will be a referendum on the island on constitutional change. And that's perfectly okay and acceptable. It is, of course, part of the Good Friday Agreement 
and there will be a time where we make real the concept of self-determination that's nothing to be scared of or fearful of it will be a democratic process just as any other referendum on the island of ireland in terms of time frames i don't think that um a quick border poll would be in anyone's interests. Instead, I fall into the category of people who believe that the process will be incredibly complex. There are really difficult um, and also really boring issues that need to be fleshed out in order for anyone to make a informed de uh, decision, such as pensions, education, healthcare. These are the bread and butter of people's lives and they need to know what they're going to vote for in any uh, referendum on constitutional change. The Good Friday Agreement was drawn up and posted out to every household on the island of Ireland, and I believe that any process on a vote of constitutional change should be done in the same way, where everyone has the answers in front of them and they know what change might look like. I think that that process will take a considerable amount of time. Scotland took two years to draw up their plan on independence, but I think when it comes to the island of Ireland, it will take a lot longer. And so what I'd like to see is a citizens assembly on an all island basis set up so we can have more dialogue and conversations. Because any event that I've taken part in or dialogue series, I've taken part in the shared island units dialogue series, um, any of these events, you can feel that there is a real hunger to have these conversations. People are willing to engage. And I think that with Brexit, what we've seen is this concept of a United Ireland has moved away from some romantic notion that might have been primarily in the minds of nationalists to a more realistic um, question that people are asking in terms of, well, what would that look like? Would that mean I'd be part of the European Union again? Will that mean that my children will have better opportunities? What will the economic impact be if we were to you know, reunify the island? So I think that the effect of Brexit has changed people's perspectives on what that might look like and that it will only really be a matter of time until we have that vote. And my greatest concern is that we will not have the legwork done beforehand to ensure that people can make the best decision for their needs. I would note that there are a number of campaign groups already set up in terms of maintaining Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. There is We Make NI and um, another group that's also been set up that's targeting primarily those who are the others who don't vote for unionist or nationalist parties. This is good. I welcome these campaign groups being set up because people need to have strong yes and no camps in order to make an informed decision. And I think the establishment of these campaign groups shows us that we are in fact on a trajectory towards having these votes. And in my view, in terms of a time frame, I would be happy to see a vote within the next five to seven years. I would be concerned about a vote prior to that because I don't know if there would be enough work done. Of course, I mean, it's first of all, it's within the gift of the Secretary of State uh, that uh, a border poll can happen. And the Secretary of State has to uh, believe, he or she has to believe that, you know, that there's a, a possibility that, that such a vote would would result in the kind of constitutional change that many people on the national side of the argument would like to see happening. If, if you're honest, can you see uh, a, a Secretary of State honestly believing uh, him or herself in the next five, seven years that a vote like that would likely to opt in favour of a United Ireland? Well, it's very difficult to know because we don't know the criteria. Um, we don't know what the Secretary of State is using in order to assess the likelihood of such an outcome. I'm, I'm it's guessing, hard to predict. I'm guessing I'm a 50% plus one voting for United <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> yeah, but it's hard to know. How, are they going to how is the Secretary of State going to measure that? You know, is he measuring that through the Assembly in terms of who's holding which seats? Is he measuring that in terms of opinion polls? Um, so we don't know, you know, they have to believe that, that a majority will vote for United Ireland. Well, what are they basing that belief off? And that's something that we don't know yet. There's a bit of vagueness around understanding the process. And I saw that um, Neil Richmond, TD from the South, has put forward a recommendation. The Secretary of State does actually reveal what the criteria is after the next Assembly election. I think that would be 
a good idea um, because it will provide clarity to people. Um, do I think that the Secretary of State could call a border poll in the next five to seven years? Yes. Um, I don't know if it will be purely based on the fact that a majority of people might vote for United Ireland or if it might be convenient in some way for the current British government who are on a path for a hard Brexit and are having difficulties in ensuring that Northern Ireland and the peace process remain intact. The, the, the very first part of our conversation, we talked about that issue that drove you to the courts and you talked about, you know, how you, you were kind of standing up for my, my words, not yours, but those who uh, identified themselves as British and who were falling victim to, to the same kind of problems as you and Jake experienced. And you used earlier on uh, as well the word respect uh, in relation to, you know, the politics, I suppose, in, in the North. How important is it that that whatever conversations do take place, whatever arguments are made, that that they take place in a respectful way. You know, I mean, it's you, you're happy to see strong, uh, sort of strong groupings on one side of the argument and on the other, but in the middle, there has to be surely a respectful conversation. Yes, there has to be, and I think that. That's part and parcel of the Good Friday Agreement as well, is respect for identity and respect for each other. I've always strived in my work to try to be respectful of those, especially those that hold a different opinion to my own, because I find that it's those opinions um, that inform me to be better in my own work. And we share the island, the, the island will continue to be shared um, in any possible change. And it's important that we take into account all those who are going to be impacted by that change. And in terms of those who identify as British in Northern Ireland during our campaign, I did find that they were underrepresented by their unionist representatives who failed to see that this was a barrier that was affecting everyone's birthright in Northern Ireland. And I met many people um, often by chance. Uh, there was one person I met one day when getting a taxi into town who turned to me and said that he had renounced his British citizenship and that he came from the Shankle. And that it caused a lot of um, a lot of upset in his own family that he went through this process, but he had to do it in order to keep his family together. So he renounced his British citizenship and opted to take up an Irish passport. And he thought to himself that he would be able to just reclaim British citizenship easily. And I didn't have the heart to tell him then that that's not the case. And in fact, those who have renounced British citizenship in Northern Ireland are not guaranteed to be able to reclaim it. Rather, it's up to the Secretary of State for the Home Department and it costs over a thousand pounds to even apply. So these people continue to have a barrier to their rights, especially those who've already went through the process of renouncing. Emma, the, the line recommendations. The, Emma, sorry, we lost you briefly there. Just if you re go over that last, okay. last bit of your, your point again, if you don't mind. No problem. Um, in the recent Northern Ireland Affairs Committee hearing, I made recommendations to the committee that those who've already renounced British citizenship should be able to reclaim that citizenship and freely, because the Good Friday Agreement provides everyone with the right to be accepted as Irish or British or both. And it's not just people such as myself who are Irish who are having their rights to be accepted as such denied, but it's also people who are British too. And it's important that this right is fully implemented into domestic UK citizenship legislation not just to protect our rights as Irish citizens in the here and now, but to protect those who identify as British in the event of any constitutional change, because current legislation does leave those who are British also vulnerable. I wonder, um, listening to you, if there are any circumstances which would, that might persuade you in the event of a border poll to vote ag against, you know, going for United Ireland, I mean, should it be membership or other ways of the European Union, uh, the, the state of the respective economies, state of the health service, education service, infrastructure, any of these things, is there anything that would stop you voting for a united Ireland? No, <laughs> is the short yeah, answer. Um, just, that really made an <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll go into that a little bit. Um, for me, I think there are a lot of failings across this island, north and south. In the north, there's been a failure to fully invest in the Good Friday Agreement and implement it in full. 23 years on, we still don't have a Bill of Rights. 
units, ed education remains 93% segregated. Mixed housing has not been fully invested in and continues to underdeliver. We see the politics becoming more divisive, not less so. In the South, there are also major problems in terms of healthcare and housing. For me, I think that the possibility of constitutional change will open up a conversation across this island, not just between those of us who are Irish or British, but also all the other communities that live in Ireland and in the North who currently don't have representation. For example, the EU citizens in Northern Ireland who have no way of naturalizing as an Irish citizen unless they're married to an Irish citizen, but they may have been living here for the past 30 years. Ethnic minority groups, traveler groups, there's so many that will be able to contribute to the conversation. And I find that very exciting, the fact that there's a possibility that we as citizens might be able to have a meaningful impact on such massive issues, that we might be able to give feedback on education, feedback on healthcare, create a new healthcare system, create a system where rights can be embedded across this island, and also looking at creating new national symbols as well. I mean, not too many people get to have those kind of conversations, and I find that to be very exciting. But also in terms of emotional level too, I think that the reunification of this island will be cathartic for people. And that when we talk about reconciliation, for me, the next logical step in reconciliation has to be reunifying the island of Ireland. And it's there where true reconciliation can begin, not just between people in the north, but between people north and south. For, for many people, they talk of things like reunification and partition uh, are, are almost theoretical concepts. You're a South Derry woman, but you now live very close to the border in County Fermanagh. So it's, uh, there are pragmatic issues at play here. There are practical issues. How, how do you find uh, the impact on your life of, of the border when you live as close to it as you now do? I mean, it is incredible that I can, um, you know, switch phone networks from the comfort of my living room where I currently live on the island at the minute, or if I go out for my morning run on a Sunday, I'm crossing the border into the Republic of Ireland. So really it has been um, eye-opening to experience that. And I think that my, ex my experience so far of living in a border constituency makes me very acutely aware of a number of issues that have been allowed to languish over the last few decades in terms of accessibility, for example, and poverty. In the Northwest, we are all but disconnected from much of the island. And it strikes me that that puts people in a very difficult position in terms of poverty. If people are forced to have to have a car, then that's an expense that they have to take on because they can't get buses or trains from where they live in the Northwest. If both uh, people work in different jobs and they have to have two cars and that then puts an added expense and pushes them under the poverty line as well. I think that living here has opened my eyes to those concerns and it's also made me more acutely aware of how impossible it would be for there to be any return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. And I'm acutely aware that there are many within unionist political camps that are in some way hoping that Brexit would have brought a hard border and it would be completely unworkable, not just in terms of how that would work in operation, but I think that any return to sort of border structures or any kind of border on the island of Ireland would also it would raise concerns around the border that exists in people's minds and it would make people concerned that we'd be taking a step backwards and not forwards. So living here really has expanded my understanding of the constituencies and the counties that have seemingly been abandoned over the last hundred years. Well Emma, if uh, moving to Fermanagh has opened your eyes, I think uh, the last half hour or so will have opened uh, many people's uh, many of our viewers eyes to maybe aspects of this whole question of the partition of this island in in ways that maybe they had never previously considered. Thanks a million for joining us on the series and thanks for being so candid and uh, so forthright in, in sharing your views with us. Thank you so much.